This Relag Radio podcast is brought to you by Economics. Everyone has questions about their farm. From general inquiries to in-depth fertilizer questions, find straightforward answers at nutrient-economics.com. It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Wednesday, midweek edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much, of course, for you making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday as harvest season continues. And also a big shout out to everybody listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast, of course, as as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to today's show. We got uh, a couple really, really great guests. We got JP Gervais, Chief Economist with Farm Credit Canada. JP is going to talk about the new, newly released, I should say, 2023 mid year land value report. So we can take a look now at has there been any impact on land values based on rising interest rates, farm profitability changes, just overall negative sentiment. Out there, as we we think about some of the data we've been talking about here on the show from the Canadian Farmer Sentiment Index, people have been quite negative about the future, don't think it's a good time to invest in 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 capital assets. Yet, what does that mean for for land values? So we'll we got the numbers to talk about today, which I'm looking forward to doing, of course, with JP. We're also going to be joined today by Andrew Pritchard. He's a meteorologist with Nutrien, based out of the U.S. We're going to talk about a couple things. One. Get an idea about the Eastern Canadian forecast as we get into uh, the the really the, the the heart of corn and soybean harvest here. Uh, some questions in some parts about the corn finishing uh, as we've been talking about here on this show. So we'll talk about that fall weather uh, for for the eastern side of the country, central and eastern Canada. And, and then I think the big question, honestly, for me is what can we expect from a moisture standpoint? for fall for Western Canada. And more importantly, actually, is what is the expectations of the snowpack for this winter? Major concerns in some part about dry dugouts, dry reservoirs. We have real challenges, even in some of the irrigation areas that are very concerned. So as much as we need a lot of fall moisture here, once harvest is all wrapped up for pasture conditions and for uh, moisture reserves on some of the cropping land, I think we got to start talking more about what the snowpack is going to be as as well. So we'll discuss that with Andrew. We're also going to talk today to Paul Sinkovich. He is the president of Vantage Ag. They have a new fertilizer product on the market that is uh, sounds pretty cool, and uh, you're going to want to definitely pay attention to that product spotlight today as well. If you have any feedback on today's show, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media platforms as Real Agriculture, or you can always call that Real Ag feedback line. Now, you dial the number, press the number three, and you leave me a voicemail. You don't even got to come live on the show, so it's easy, right? You, you leave voicemails all the time. Might as well leave them for me as well. Give me your perspective. 855-776-6147. Now, got uh, an email here from Jeff. And, and Jeff asked an interesting question. You, uh, you know, uh, it, Depending where you are in Canada, also I think depending on your generation potentially, you... We, we, we are very confused in Canada, okay? In, in the sense that we... We have uh, we, we bounce back and forth between metric and imperial when we talk about measurements. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Like liters per acre. you think it'd be liters per hectare, but it's not. It's liters per acre. Or uh, grams per... Like it, we, we do bizarre stuff when it comes to some of our, our measurements. Now, one of the things we do bounce back and forth on is miles and kilometers. Sometimes you talk in miles, sometimes you talk in kilometers. Speed, I find myself always talking kilometers, but uh, I may say distance in miles 
which is, you know, that, once again, we're very confused here. <laughs> so Jeff asked an interesting question. His email says, hey, Sean, listening to the rapid fire today via podcast, as always, and I have a very naive question as a guy who hasn't been lucky enough to have ventured east of the Sioux. When you're talking to anyone in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, or Alberta, and they talk about the elevator being 30 miles away, are they talking miles? I find, depending on where you are in Ontario, some areas talk miles and a lot talk kilometers, but sometimes people say miles in conversation, even though they are still referring to kilometers. Perhaps that perhaps that's what get, you get from being in the 45 to 50 age category. Enjoy the show. Thanks. So I appreciate the email, Jeff. That, so that's where we really get confusing. If we're saying miles, but we really mean kilometers. Now, I had responded to Jeff and said, you know, I think when people are saying miles, I've always took it as they're saying miles. But do you ever make that mistake? Do you ever say miles, but you really mean kilometers? Just as a, as a like, almost like a lingo? Uh, fascinating. Uh, and, and hey, send me your feedback on that. And do you, what are some of your confusing metric versus imperial? And if for American listeners, you're like, you guys in Canada, whoa, whoa. The, the, very confusing. Very confusing. I, I Listen, yes, I agree. Okay, send me your feedback, shaney at realagriculture.com. Okay, when we come back on Real Ag Radio, we got JP Gervais here. Let's dig in to land values and what it means potentially for the future. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147. Your co-op grow team are your local experts because we live here too. Our agronomic specialists stay up to date with the latest research and technology to help support your entire farm operation. Talk to our team for advice tailored to your farm's needs. We have recommendations to help you optimize your crop yield and quality while enhancing the health of your land. Co-op. We're all growing together. Here for your farm. Here for your family. Learn more at coop.crs slash farm. CDC Endure is a new oat line from Alliance Seed. High yielding with excellent disease resistance and the quality end users ask for, all in one great oat variety. CDC Endure provides the high beta glucan levels to make heart healthy products like breakfast cereals. For more information on CDC Endure oats, as well as any other products from Alliance Seed, check out allianceseed.com or visit any Alliance Seed authorized retailers. Protecting your nitrogen is smart. And a nitrogen granule with a polymer coating that releases in response to conditions that promote plant growth? Well, that's me. I'm the environmentally smart nitrogen granule that gives the nutrition crops need when they need it. Reducing nitrogen loss and increasing nutrient availability. Imagine feeding me to your fields. Me. Now, wait a minute. Hey, can I rethink this? ESN Environmentally Smart Nitrogen Fertilizer. Learn more at smartnitrogen.com. One of the things I've been really looking forward to is is seeing some of the data on how all the macroeconomic impacts, like things like rising interest rates, uh, the concerns about the economy, concerns about shrinking farm profitability. Does any of that have some sort of impact on uh, 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 the land values uh, across the country? We've got a new report out today that uh, shed some light on that, and we'll get to that in a second. But first, low-rate MBPT solutions claim to protect nitrogen, but no imitator product delivers like Anvil Nitrogen Stabilizer, the next-gen urease inhibitor from Coke Agronomic Services. See how others stack up to the proven power for Anvil at DefenderN.ca. Now joining us to talk about the 2023 mid-year land value report from Farm Credit Canada is J.P. Gervais. Chief Economist with Farm Credit Canada. JP, welcome to the show. Hey, it's always a pleasure, Sean. Thanks for the invite. Now, uh, across the country, up until uh, the mid-year point, we're looking at land values up 7.7% in the first six months of 2023. You you allude to in the report that a lot of this has to do with a lack of supply. Uh, Talk about that dynamic. Well, for sure, yeah. It's it's one of the things that obviously the, the economic environment no secret, right? It's totally changed over the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. I mean, higher interest rates and so forth. So we're seeing now, I would say for the first six months of this year, especially when you compare to 2022, I don't think 2022, that was a whole lot of 
impact from higher interest rates, but certainly in the first six months of 2023, we're seeing a little bit more caution, right? So operations are thinking twice about, you know, if something comes up, something's made available, especially if it's a desirable location from their standpoint and so forth. They're a little bit more cautious as to what's the price, what is the financial outlook for me if I were to just go ahead and buy it and so forth. Definitely more caution. Now, nonetheless, if you look at the numbers and you look at the average prices of transactions for the first six months of 2023, they've been up, you know, 7.7% in the first six months of uh, 2023. I always like as well to to take a 12-month perspective on this, right? And 12.2% is the average growth rate of of land prices in Canada. So if we have buyers that are more cautious, cautious, sorry, it's, it has to be on the supply side, right? And because supply is so limited that it doesn't take many, uh, a lot of intent to buy to actually drive prices up. And I think that's perhaps what's reflected in the study is that the role of supply in the last, certainly the last six months, but even go back to 12 months, I think it certainly has stood out for me for sure. Yeah. It, it kind of like the land market and the housing market are, are different in, in some facets, but it seems right now there's some similarities. Less volume, prices still strong. Is is that fair? Yeah, well, yes. I, I like what you you said. You emphasize that they're different. They're definitely different, and and there are some though identical trends right now. I mean, if you think of the real estate market, one of the big drivers right now is the increase in population growth. So that demand has really uh, been a big factor. And a limited supply of available housing is is causing you know the rebound in price, housing prices that we've seen. But we also had a little bit of a decline at the outset of this interest rate hike cycle that that we've experienced since really early 2022. So there are some differences. I would say supply is quite limited. So on the supply side, I'd say it's 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 a bit similar. On the demand side, I would argue it's a bit different. I, I think you know the population growth in Canada that we've recorded like the highest of the last. 40 plus years, if you look at July 1st and where we were at then, um, I think that that shows, you know, it shows up on demand being a little bit stronger than what we're seeing for the farm economy, really. So JP, why is supply tighter right now? What What is it about the dynamics of the market that's creating less opportunity uh, out, out there for the buyers? Well, if you look at it from the land owner perspective, right? So the idea is that you probably take some sort of financial outlook to your portfolio if you own land and maybe you own different assets as well. And if you look at the rate of return of the last, I'm going to say 10 years, you can probably go back even further in time. I mean, the return has been very good. Right? And not only it's been very good, it's been stable. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find a ratio of expected return r- relative to volatility that shows up better than farmland. So, from a, an owner standpoint, I don't mean to say that there are financial institutions and, and different buyers that don't even are related to the or connected to the, the farm community. But even that, you know, if you think of an estate, if you think of a farm family if you, that own land and so forth, they're looking at it and they're probably thinking that, well, it's been a pretty good return. I mean, we've been able to, uh, you know, raise land, land rental rates as well, you know, to, not necessarily to match up the increase in land values we've seen, but certainly to offset some of the higher interest rates because there's an opportunity cost associated with owning land. And so you have to account for that as well. But all said and done, the return has been steady and positive. And so I think there's very little uh, incentive to put land for sale in the marketplace. And the outlook, let's face it as well, you know, from a perspective of farming, I mean, we've had in 2023, we currently have some challenges for sure, relative drought and, you know, lower commodity prices and the prices have declined, but not as much. So profitability is definitely lower. Um, but the outlook long term, I mean, in my head, remains very positive. I'm yeah. very optimistic. And again, I don't need to be a cheerleader or, or anything like that. But I think the outlook, because of global food security concerns, even domestic food security concerns, the outlook remains positive. Yeah, stable is a good way to put it. It's, it's almost like a guaranteed annuity uh, in, in some ways. In some ways, stability is a bit weird because the last thing we've seen in the farming business is stability. It's been very volatile. If you think of commodity prices, you know, starting to dating back to the, the beginning of the war in Ukraine and all of that, there's been a lot of volatility. But when you look at it from the asset or a balance sheet standpoint, it's been quite steady, actually. Now, 
there, there is some provincial differences on an absolute value increase standpoint. Now, this is, you know, you and I have chatted before about the, the value of the land in each of the provinces relative to the return that land can produce. So there, there is an efficiency, almost like saber metrics in baseball kind of way to look at this. But in an absolute value standpoint, there is some, some differences. Co- Quebec up 11.4% in the first six months, Ontario up 6.9%. Same kind of crop, same livestock. That's a, that's a difference. Also, what stood out, Saskatchewan up 11.4%, Alberta up only 3%. Uh, talk about those those two gaps. So, I mean, if you look at Central Canada, I think the one thing I'd like to emphasize is that we need to take a little bit more of a long-term view than six months or even 12 months, right? 2022, so January 1st, December, uh, the end of December in 22, we had an average increase in Ontario of 19% or roughly 19%. So that's that was the strongest by far in Canada. And quite frankly, very, very significant. Now, I think Quebec, you know, if you look at the increase in Quebec, it's catching up a little bit to what we'd seen in Ontario in 2022. So there's a little bit of that, right? The market isn't, uh, the volume of transactions isn't so big so that we would expect a perfect, uh, uh, you know, that, that the market uh, values would react exactly the same at the exact same point in time. So there's that. Central Canada, if you look at margins in 2021, 20, 22, uh, even some to some extent currently right now, it's still penciling uh, profit for sure in 23. The margins have been really positive in 21 and 22. So good revenues. And so that we're able to offset the high input costs as well as high interest rates. Now on the ferry side, it's been a little bit more challenging from a profitability standpoint. Uh, 2023 is going to be challenging for sure. Uh, again, depending on where you're at, there's some lots of nuances with regards to moisture levels across. But I do think that from a a, a uh, farming standpoint, if you look at land values in Saskatchewan, and you look at some of that ratio relative to revenues you can gross off the land, count for higher interest rates. That ratio is a lot more attractive in Saskatchewan than it is in Alberta. I'm not saying that we have buyers, you know, I mean, it might be some of that for sure. You know, buyers in Alberta are looking at, you know, land in Saskatchewan and so forth. But it really is that the, the, the farming profitability outlook from buying land at current values in Saskatchewan looks a little bit better than what it is in, in Alberta right now. And I think it explains some of the price movements, given that, you know, um, land prices in Alberta on average are higher than they were in uh, Saskatchewan. You know, be- this past summer, uh, Real Agri Studies, the market research arm of, of Real Agriculture, Justin Funk and I, my partner, had had done some work on an, on an inflation study. And, and what we saw in that study is... Not all buyers are, or I guess not all producers are looking at buying land the same. We had asked producers, have you bought or do you plan to buy land in 2023-24? The younger you were, the more likely you were to buy land. And the larger the farm, the more likely you were to to buy land. Um, the, the, I guess uh, from that standpoint, that shouldn't surprise anybody, but the it's really looking like the big just get bigger. Well, in some ways, for sure. I mean, like especially at current market conditions, right? So if you're looking at land prices right now, it's really hard to pencil a profit, you know, buying land at current prices, given where interest rates are and so forth. So it's not unusual to have to bring in revenues from another acre to sort of cover and make sure that you, you know, it makes sense from a profitability standpoint. Now, does it make sense from a, uh, I think it makes more sense now when you look at it this way that from a, a wealth building standpoint, uh, but also it needs to match your strategic objective, right? And so, yes, we have fewer transactions, but what we're saying is that those transactions match the strategic plan of the operation. And so you're not buying just for the sake of buying, but you do have a plan of where you want to take your business. And if economies of scale is the way that you feel like you need to sustain you know, profitability in your business and so forth, yes, you know, you're still going to look at buying some land despite you know, a little bit more being a little bit more cautious given the environment. So not totally surprised. And really, frankly, when you look at it from the perspective of the pure economics of it, I mean, it doesn't take many buyers or prospective buyers to lead to higher prices, right? You only need two really to, to you know, given what is available to, to really sort of have a little bit of pressures on land value. So from that standpoint, I'm not too surprised that despite the lower volume of transactions, despite that tight supply availability that we have. Man. 
Now, what you know, a piece of data that we did get in that study that supports what you're saying about Ontario, for example, is in Ontario, 12% of the people answered the survey said they had or intended to buy land here in in uh, 23, 24. Whereas we get to Western Canada, and I don't have the provincial breakdown, but just Western Canada, the number was 20%. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's like one of those things where, boy, if it if it does rain the prairies there, you know, the, the, all of a sudden your perspective on the land value versus the productivity changes. It's that con- lack of consistency of that rain and that productivity that creates a bit of a risk, a bit of a risk premium, maybe there a little bit. Yeah, no, no doubt for sure. I think we've seen in Saskatchewan as well that there's been a little bit of a reward paid for soil that are doing a little bit better when it comes to moisture and so forth. So, um, that does that for sure priced into the marketplace, uh, especially in, in, in Saskatchewan, I would say, given what we've noticed. But bottom line is that, um, there's still demand out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't want to lose sight of the fact, and I would be remiss if I didn't say it, that uh, land is the most expensive price point ever, not only on an absolute dollar per acre basis, but also relative to what you can grow. Looking at expenses as well, as you know, in terms of input costs, as well as where interest rates are. And at some point in time, and I've been, you know, <laughs> we've talked a lot over the years, Sean, and I've been saying this, that I expect that land value increases to slow down, and they haven't necessarily there's been a little bit of a not a pause but certainly a little bit of a slowdown in in 2020 and so uh, in 2019 but um yeah at some point in time you know we, we we probably need to have realistic expectations of where those land value increases will, will take us and that probably will mean uh that they'll be slowing down at some point so that prices and and production growth and so forth can catch up with land valuations right now what, what's the path forward what, what, like you're, you're, I know you're, you're, uh, you're deep in these numbers and uh, seeing, you know, some of the the trends here. What, what does the path forward look like? Well, more cautions. So definitely a, a little bit of a weaker demand going forward, right? And what's holding the market is really the tight supply, and I don't expect that to change. So maybe we're probably going to see a few increases, but. It takes time for those higher interest rates to work their way in the economy. One of the things that I think we all missed, certainly I did miss, was that you know I was relying on some of the average historical time to market when it comes to monetary policy. And what this cycle has taught us is that there has been more savings. Certainly, if you look at it from the farm standpoint, there's been more wealth as well in the farm that was built over the years. And to some extent, that has um, offset some of the potential impact with regards to higher interest rates that we would have seen a little bit earlier. So going forward, I do think that this is going to continue to slow down demand. And with demand slowing down, I would I would suspect that that would lead to slower rate of appreciation and perhaps having a bit of a, a, a some stability in the marketplace, you know, not too far from now. But Again, I like I said, I've been saying that the market's going to slow down for a while here. And full disclosure, it hasn't. So uh, the crystal ball isn't perfect for by any by any means for sure. Yeah, it, gr- great stuff, JP. Really appreciate you uh, shedding some light on the six month report, and of course, uh, look forward to that annual report where we can uh, really take a look at what happened in two thousand twenty three. So thanks so much, uh, JP. Really appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Sean. Thank you. If you got some perspective on some of the data and some of the, the, the discussion around some of that data that JP and I just discussed, make sure you send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. We'll be right back on Real Ag Radio right after this. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab to our local teams with boots on the ground, we are determined to get there first. Developing top-performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. You know, there's a reason we call it the corn school. Videos on everything from planter setup, weed control, field trial results, yield strategies, and so much more. The corn school on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BSF. 
Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest podcast today. As a grower, you spend a lot of time focused on the details. And sometimes it's only after harvest that you can step back and see the bigger picture. At AGI, we spend a lot of time focused on details too, making sure you can store your grain how you need to and move it when you need to. Learn more at aggrowth.com. Real Ag Radio. It's now time for a product spotlight. And today we're talking to Vantage Ag. And we're joined right now by the president of Vantage Ag. It is Paul Sinkovich. Hey, Paul, how's it going? Hi, Sean. It's going great. Okay. Pretty exciting stuff happening at Vantage Ag. Uh, We're going to talk today about reacted quantum ag technology. And I know you are super pumped to tell farmers across Canada (laughs) and the U.S. about this. So what makes your new liquid fertilizers so unique for both Canada and the U.S.? Well, thanks for the opportunity, Sean. Yeah, we're we're really excited. You know, we've, we've successfully reacted all the nutrients except for calcium and boron. So we continue to work on the last two. But when our liquid fertilizers are reacted, we add a process that makes the particle size of that nutrient one-thirds to two-thirds of a nanometer. These tiny, tiny particles are only 30 to 40 times bigger than an atom. You can't make that particle size any smaller. What we find when these nutrients are sprayed on a plant, any plant, these tiny bioavailable Particles are quickly absorbed by the plant and within a couple of days are throughout the entire plant and being metabolized and used by the plant. Because the efficiency of these products are very high, uh, we are only using a fraction of the actual nutrient. Crop safety is impeccable. And with this new technology, we can now feed plants what they need through foliar feeding more than we ever thought possible. And with that, we're able to... You know, if successful, we're, we're able to get the plant when it actually needs those nutrients, right? Not just all front-loaded on the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really good point, Sean, because, you know, a lot of things that uh, that we grow, you know, canola is the, obviously a big uh, crop in Western Canada. And when you look at sulfur needs for canola, as an example, canola starts to use a lot more sulfur later in the, in the growing season. So if you, you know, apply to all of your sulfur early in the year and and get a fair amount of rain, you know, things like nitrogen, sulfur, and boron can move readily in the soil. So when it needs it the most, it might not be available. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the benefits and and what this means for growers when when we think about this technology. Well, it, it does take a different mindset because now we're able to, you know, take a look at, okay, how can we, how can we reduce risk? I think, you know, as a manufacturer, I believe that's one of our responsibilities is how can we help growers reduce their risk? You know, nothing's going down in price, it seems. You know, fuel is higher, fertilizer is higher, um, all the things that are, are, are high input costs to, to grow a crop. And so, you know, we believe that this new technology will allow growers to only place the granular fertilizer that is required to get the crop off to a healthy start. After that, we can top dress crops with these products to get the plant what it needs when it needs it. You know, and if Mother Nature isn't cooperating and it doesn't look like you're going to have a crop, then you don't invest more. And that actually happened a lot uh, to some of our customers in central Alberta this year. It was hot and dry. They didn't have much of a crop. So the some of the product that we sold them is still sitting in their sheds. So that's a way that we can help reduce grower risk. And, and when we talk about the crop, you, you gave canola as an example, but the technology you're, you're talking about being this this is applicable to a lot of different crops across the entire the entirety of Canada and the U.S. Right? Absolutely. Uh, we've got a partner in Malaysia that did some testing on some uh, trees that produce palm oil. Now I've been told they're not palm trees, but I'm going to call them palm trees. <laughs> you know, the, the only way that they can get nitrogen into a tree is melting urea and spraying it on a tree. And they did testing and they came up with a an answer and they said, well, that can't be right. So they did the test again, but they've told us that our uh, nano liquid nitrogen is almost a hundred percent more efficient uh, than top, top dressing with urea. So 
you know, here we are, we've, we've taken uh, products that are traditionally very uh, inefficient and we've completely flipped it to the other end. And so that, that's what makes it um, so unique. Uh, you know, when we talk about carbon footprint and, and, and use efficiency, but we've, we've completely changed the game with this new technology. And, and Paul, we're talking about low rates. Like that, that's what's really mind blowing about this. It is. I'm sure when I talk to people about, about our rates, they just think, well, there's something wrong with that guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about because our rates are extremely low. Just to give you an example, all of our micros are 50 to 80 mils an acre. Um, you know, the middle rate of 65 mil an acre, that means one 10 liter jug will do an entire quarter section. That's amazing stuff. Okay, so the website is vantage.ag. If somebody wants to find out more, go to the website or how else do they find the products? You know, one of the things people are welcome to do is, is to give us a shout and have a conversation. One of the things that we'll be doing this year uh, throughout Western Canada at all the major ag shows uh, is some info, info meetings. So they'll be open to, you know, the growers, industry, uh, farmers as well, if they want to come and, and find out uh, uh, not only about the technology, but, you know, a lot of the results that we've uh, been able to compile over the last couple of years with people that have been actually out there using this new technology. We've been talking to Paul Sigovich. He is president of Vantage Ag, and the product is Reacted Quantum Ag Technology. Paul, thanks so much for joining us here today. Thank you, Sean. We'll be right back on Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM, right after this. dedication. Watching the sunset over your crop is one of life's simple pleasures. The anticipation of it all. We know that feeling. Introducing our new Airflex NXT, our best honeybee header yet with the closest cut ever. Light, fast reacting, and infinitely adjustable. More yield, less time, and work. Airflex NXT focuses on the future. What drives your next? Visit honeybee.ca or contact your nearest honeybee dealer. When it comes to your farm, you demand performance because what goes in determines what comes out. At Pride Seeds, we deliver on performance. With best-in-class corn hybrid seed, you'll see results when it comes to premium yield in all the ways that matter. Moisture, nutrition, dollars per acre, and of course, tonnage. So discover your farm's advantage, the Pride Seeds Advantage. Visit your local dealer or prideseeds.com today. Really looking forward to hearing about uh, the weather forecast here for fall and winter for different parts of Canada. But first, I want to talk about nothing beats genuine. Your equipment is no different. New Holland Genuine Lubricants are the only lubricants engineered, tested, and proven for New Holland equipment. When performance is at stake, always keep it genuine. Visit your New Holland dealer to learn more. Let's jump into a conversation about the weather This is an important topic, of course. Uh, There's uh, parts of Western Canada very short of moisture. And, of course, uh, out east and central Canada looking to see what fall conditions bring for the completion of that corn and soybean harvest. Joining us right now is meteorologist with Nutrien. It is Andrew Pritchard. Andrew, welcome to the show. I am so happy to be here. Thank you for having me back. Okay, let's start uh, start in central and eastern Canada. And, uh, you know, we, we've had some unusually hot weather here as of late. I saw something on the news, people out in kayaks on, in the Great Lakes and enjoying, you know, some pretty, pretty high temperatures. But there has been a lot of concern uh, about that corn actually getting to the, the maturity stage because of the lack of sunlight through certain parts of the year. What, what, are your, what are your models showing in terms of what we can expect here for October, November from a weather perspective in that region? Yeah, absolutely. The same pattern that's been experienced up there is what we've enjoyed down here in the Midwest of the United States. I took the dog out for a walk this morning and was wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And I'm just like, you know, this feels like summer. And and that's the way I've kind of been framing it. And in doing so, framing it as maybe our last week of this really summery weather, because we are going to see a big pattern shift as we head into this weekend. And it looks like that is going to hold on for at least a couple of weeks as we go deeper into the middle 
and end of October. And so with that is going to be a big dive in our temperatures. We're going to see some cooler temperatures settling into the region. We're also going to bring some moisture into the region as well. So a little bit of an increase in shower and perhaps some thunderstorm activity. And then unfortunately, you know, bringing the cloud cover back in. So it's going to be a big pivot, a big sudden pivot from like sunny, warm weather to much cloudier, cooler and gloomier weather. So you'll really see that shift begin over the weekend. That's when we'll see a front come in. Really, I should say at the end of this week, it's it's like Thursday into Friday, the front sweeps in, it'll bring a bigger area of showers and storms. And then the upper level low kind of merges with, now we're seeing the remnants of tropical storm Philippe. And that just kind of sits there and spins over the next seven days or so. So we could see those pesky showers lingering in some cases into early and mid next week. And then we start looking into you know the week two time frame, and we're already starting to see maybe things reloading with another storm system coming in. So it looks like we start to begin this maybe more typical fall cadence of bringing a storm system in, you know, once every week or two. And then some of those, you know, they have the tendency to kind of sit and spin is what we like to say. And that leaves that kind of cloudy, cool, gloomy weather overhead. So that's what we have in the near term. And I know that's going to be frustrating to some as we kind of, you know, bring an end to the sunny and in warm weather. So this, you know, wide open harvest window, not going to just run on, through, you know, unimpeded in October. I think, you know, we'll still see some stretches of warmer weather, but definitely a, a noticeable shift in the next seven days. Kind of pulling us back to the average and what we can expect. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah. And that's what we see as we kind of try to look, you know, into weeks three and four. We know that we're in a period of really low predictability as we start looking out beyond week two with El Nino and other competing factors. That's just kind of the nature here as we go into a transitional period from summer into winter. There's a lot of chaos there. And so with that can come some of these bigger pattern shifts. So this is what we got over the next two weeks. Looking deeper out, we see things kind of near the average. So, you know, you kind of hit it there. We'll see some warmth, but get some variety in there. My my perception is, is that was hurricane season kind of slower this year on the coast or or, I I apologize if I have like totally watched. No, it, 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 It's been a weird year because we did come into it, you know, with with kind of a shifting forecast here with a, you know, higher than average forecast, but then maybe a a slower start in some of the areas. And so there's been some competing ideas with, you know, really warm ocean temperatures supporting a lot of activity, but then at times higher than normal wind shear across the area. And so that's kind of worked against some of these storms. And and certainly once they have developed, it's kind of uh, worked against them working their way northward up along the coast. So It's been kind of curious that we've seen some of these, uh, you know, we've seen a a landfall here across Maine and then, you know, coastal Canada. And we may see that happen again here as we get it toward the weekend early next week. But you're right. It's been kind of an unusual hurricane season, but we're kind of right in the middle of it. And there's certainly, you know, reasons to believe we could still see another, you know, pulse or two in, in terms of tropical activity. So it's something that we're continuing to monitor. And that's one of those big wild cards that we, you know, again, we have to look at in one to two week time increments, but we know that it, you know one storm could really be d- disruptive to the pattern across North America in terms of moisture and the overall storm track. So it's something we're monitoring closely you know, at this time of year. So what, what I'm hearing is back to that cloudy, kind of more traditional, gloomy kind of weather, uh, gray skies, but it, it's going to also bring some harvest moisture, which could provide some challenges uh, as people are trying to roll through the field. Absolutely. Yeah, that is kind of the story from from Ontario. And then again, I, I'm kind of tying it all together, bringing it back to the Midwest, the US. Yeah. But we're kind of riding this pattern shift together. Definitely a shift that's going to, you know, bring to an end this wide open period of dry, warm weather and, and bring some moisture. And in, in some cases, you know, some areas need that moisture, but it is frustrating as we get into harvest season, we'll have to kind of dance around these bigger storm systems. Yeah, it f- feels like fall football weather. It, uh, Absolutely. For, yep. for sure. Yeah. I, okay, all good. Okay, let's jump to the western side of the country where, you know, for the most part, it, maybe not as much Manitoba, but I think still to somewhat of an extent it is true. Saskatchewan and Alberta, really dry. And, you know, even parts of Saskatchewan where things looked more promising from a moisture standpoint at the beginning of, of seeding season, we're back to where we started uh, a year ago. Can and we've been talking. I've been saying it. The audience has been saying it. We need some fall moisture. Mm-hmm. Is there any hope? There is some hope, you know, and and that's kind of the story that unfortunately I've been telling 
going back to the end of the summer and we haven't yet seen that hope materialize. I want to kind of not traffic too much hope, you know, but the good thing here is we've gotten rid of La Nina. And when we kind of look for correlations between prairie drought and some of our bigger ocean, you know, teleconnections, we do see that La Nina is commonly associated with some of our more significant drought across the Canadian prairie. And we just ended a three year long period of a, a strong La Nina that, you know, kept fading and then coming right back. And so it kind of fits that we've seen you know, three rather frustrating years in a row in terms of prairie moisture. And you're right that each of the past three years has had a flavor of its own where, you know, some areas have been drier, some have then seen relief, but overall it's been a period of, of, you know, frustration in terms of moisture there. So as we get rid of La Nina, we remove one of the biggest, you know, instigators of drought across the Canadian prairie. So that's where I kind of have some good news is as we go through the fall, the winter into the next growing season, we don't necessarily go into next growing season with the deck all, already stacked against us. Now, the other side of that is we don't necessarily stack the deck in our favor by flipping to El Nino. As we look at El Nino, there's not a strong correlation between a sudden push towards high moisture, you know, high storm track across uh, the Canadian prairie. So I would say exercise some caution or some patience maybe is the better word here. I think that we're going to move in the direction of improvement across the prairie. But I think instead of talking about doing it in six days or six weeks, it's probably more like six months, you know, on that kind of time frame. So we we start to get to a better background state, one that should support more in the way of storm systems making their way through. But we know that it's really it's, you know, three or four specific storm systems that are going to bring that moisture to the region to replenish things. And we can't see those specific storm systems yet to know where that is. So, you know, the thing that gives me optimism here is, again, El Nino that typically favors a stronger, more consolidated jet stream across North America. When we see a stronger, more focused jet stream, that typically means stronger storm systems, more in the way of moisture. When we look at La Nina, we're typically talking about a split jet stream, weaker flow, and that's what's really kind of had a a void of impactful moisture. So that stronger jet stream, it gives me hope, but typically in the winter that's focused further south. That's, you know, usually across the southern U.S. is where that active storm track is. So a a typical winter with El Nino across the Canadian prairies is going to be usually a little more mild without that stronger northern branch of the jet stream. We're not talking about bringing as much cold air in, but without that stronger north jet stream, we're not talking about, you know, typically high impact storm systems either. So so opportunity for, uh, you you tell me if I got the geography right, but opportunity for Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, Colorado, Montana to get some snow more so than the Western Canadian prairies. Sure. Yep. The further south you go, the the higher your odds here are typically with an El Nino pattern. But again, every El Nino is different. You know, yeah. there could be a wild card here or there that pushes that further north. And we saw that with the precipitation over the summer. I don't want to get sidetracked too much, but we, you know, we're going through April, May and June thinking we were going to get rid of the drought across the Midwestern United States with this very strong flow from the jet stream. And we ended up with a blocking pattern across eastern North America that forced that storm track south. And so it was areas, you know, several states in the U.S. further south that were getting that heavy rainfall. So, again, we can adjust our expectations, you know, geographically north or south by hundreds of miles sometimes. And that's usually because of some kind of wild card that we weren't able to anticipate. So, you know, there's reason for hope, but we just got to we got to get there. And right now there's no strong indication of when that's going to happen. Yeah, that that's my understanding that I've learned that in this transition from La Nina to La Nino is we know when we know when it like officially starts and stops, like, okay, the transition, sure. the, like it's happened, but we don't, it's really difficult. And mo- one person told me impossible, which, I, but mm-hmm. I'll let you comment on that to know when the effects take place. Yep. Okay, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's a hundred percent sure. And I mean, you could look at the pattern right now and, and there's arguments over whether or not El Nino is really driving what's going on at this current state. You know, there's other players that are certainly factoring in. So you're right. You know, we can we can say, hey, El Nino is going to be strong and that's usually a big driver, but it does not mean it will be the driver and it doesn't mean that it's going to behave the way that, you know, hey, we've got six or seven examples over the last 100 years of a strong El Nino. So it should, you know, fit that bill. No, the truth is they all have their own flavor. So we we don't necessarily have a, hey, this is the El Nino storm track. It's just we've got some ideas. We can start to formulate what we think should be the theme. 
of the upcoming season here. But again, we're not looking at the actual storm track or the actual storm systems that are going to bring the weather that we're going to be impacting and that will really tell the story of the season. Yeah. So if we get, you know, kind of a mild winter in Western Canada, which means not a lot of snow, puts mm-hmm. a lot of pressure on that La Nino effect for spring. Yeah. Because we're going to have dugouts in trouble, pasture conditions. Like we're, there's going to be a lot of pressure on mother nature to uh, come through once we get yeah. to like March, April. Absolutely. No, I know. It's it's a tricky situation, one where I feel like I'm seeing light at the end of the tunnel, but I also know that it's going to be an anxious wait until we actually get to that point. And there are, you know, other dominoes that may fall if we don't get that moisture to come in sooner rather than later. When, when we look at the North American complex, just the, the entire, you know, Canada, U.S. Uh, geography, what are you most interested in watching through these winter months? What, what, what like geek out here for me for a second, sure. to wrap up. What, what are you looking at? Yeah. So a couple of things. I mean, a, a lot of it comes to moisture, not just across the Canadian prairie, but we're dealing with some severe moisture loss here in uh, parts of the Midwest and the Southern United States. And that's really impacted, you know, the Mississippi River is a big topic right now. We're seeing, you know, getting close to record lows and the forecast is not good in the near term for, for moisture there. So that has a high impact on shipping. Uh, and with a, again, a pattern that could theoretically be dry heading deeper into the fall, that's certainly going to be something that we'll, we'll be watching closely. But the flip side of that with El Nino and that forecast for, uh, you know, a period of stronger jet stream flow, you know, my mind, when I see periods of high flow in the jet stream coming across the central U.S., I always go to severe weather and start to look at, you know, hey, we're going to be bringing some high impact storm systems in here. You know, we typically associate that more with spring, but we can sometimes during the transition from summer to winter, see another period of um, high activity for strong storms across the central and southern United States. So it's kind of an exciting period here where, again, we're kind of coming out of the summer doldrums where it gets a little boring forecasting the weather in the, the middle of the country here. And uh, as things are kind of stagnant with the the slower, weaker jet stream and, and, you know, the weather has reflected that. It's been very hot, sunny and boring locally. So I know with, you know, a more active weather pattern comes headaches and, and that kind of thing. But it's exciting as a meteorologist to to kind of have the possibilities so wide open heading into another transition period. So whether it's the tropics, big storm systems coming into the middle of the U.S., or just kind of anxiously waiting and watching the drought situation from the prairie into the, the Midwest and the Central Plains, it's it's a really fascinating time to try and see uh, what questions will get answered and, you know, what questions we don't know that we have, you know, at this point going deeper into the winter. Well, Andrew, I really appreciate you joining us here today, and we'll definitely check in with you through some of these winter months and uh, get a bit of an update on how. What, what are some of the indicators as we flip the calendar to 2024? Andrew, thanks a lot for joining us here today. Really appreciate it. Happy to do it. Can't wait to talk again. Definitely, depending on where you are, some good news, bad news, uh, things to be hopeful for, not the complete total answer we want to hear in different parts, but we'll definitely uh, stay on top of this one and uh, follow up with Andrew here in a few months. Okay, let's take a break. When we come back on Real Ag Radio, we've got more. We've got a few top ag news stories of the day to cover. You're listening to Real Ag Radio. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab to our local teams with boots on the ground, we are determined to get there first. Developing top-performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. At Brett & Young, we focus on what's real. It's how we became Canada's largest independent seed company. That's why we're asking a real farmer, what do you think of BY6217TF, Brett Young's TrueFlex Canola Hybrid? What's that? <clears throat> BY6217TF, Brett Young's TrueFlex Canola Hybrid with Pod Defender Shatter Reduction Technology and Defender Rated Club Root and Black Leg Resistance. Uh, good yield, yeah. Probably choose it again. Thanks, Chris. Talk to your Brett Young retailer today to see for yourself. Brett Young, distinct by design. now time for the top ag news stories of the day. You want true nitrogen protection? Skip imitator products for an agronomically effective solution like Super U Premium Fertilizer from Coke Agronomic Services. 
Super U protects against all three forms of loss and is proven to boost yield potential. See how others stack up at defendyourn.ca. I love that. You don't want imitator stuff. No. Why Why settle for imitators? <laughs> Go to defendyourn.ca. Okay, let's get to it. Uh, the election yesterday in, in Manitoba. And Manitobans voted for change in the provincial election on Tuesday, electing a majority new Democrat government led by Premier designate Wab Canoe after seven years of progressive conservative rule. So Heather Stephenson out, Wab Canoe in NDP. Now the government again in Manitoba. It'd be interesting because Kelvin and I were talking about this uh, over the weekend. Now, in Alberta, we, we had ND, we had an NDP government for four years and a quick switch back to the conservatives. Manitoba has a bit of a habit of having longer periods. Uh, you maybe could say though, the, well, is there that going to happen in this case? I don't know. Time will definitely tell. So as of early Wednesday, the NDP was elected or leading in 34 seats with the PCs holding 22 and the Liberals down to only a single seat. And also the leader of the Liberals actually stepped down uh, as well. It appears Ron Kostitian, who served as Manitoba's Agriculture Minister from 2012 to 2016, will likely be the NDP MLA with the largest agricultural presence in their constituency as he holds 340 vote advantage over his PC rival in Dauphin. Diljit Brar, who served as NDP's agricultural critic in the province since 2019, also brings an ag background to the NDP caucus, so another possible to be the, the ag minister. If you're a watcher of U.S. politics, uh, this has been a very interesting week, as for the first time in the history of the U.S. Congress, the Speaker has been removed. Kevin McCarthy out in a, in a motion brought forward by uh, Florida GOP House member Matt Gates. Uh, a vote happened. I, I believe there was all of the all of the Democratic uh, House members plus eight on the Republican side voting out McCarthy. So now there is a search for a new speaker. We'll see. And basically, the whole all of the House is like on it's it's stopped now until they find a new speaker. So can, can, both Canada and the U.S. without uh, major speakers from a political sense, uh, Canada just did name a new speaker yesterday. Uh, the the and the, the House vote on it a little less controversy than we can expect from a U.S. perspective putting a new speaker in place and, and how that process all all rolls out and some of the role that they they function as well, obviously somewhat different. The federal and uh, Saskatchewan governments have announced funding of $5 million for the Saskatchewan Food Industries Development Centre in Saskatoon. The funding delivered through the Sustainable Canadian Agriculture Partnership SCAP will support the food centre's work to enable the continued growth of value-added revenue and agri-food exports in the province over the next five years. Also encourage you to go to realagriculture.com. I have uh, an interview on the new Climate Smart Report out from RBC Rural Bank, the RL Food Institute, and Boston Consulting Group talking about the nine areas of recommendations for Canada to really compete, specifically in the areas of, of sustainable agriculture when it comes to competing with the United States. They believe there is a real lack of funding comparing Canada to the U.S. as well as Europe and uh, some of the Asian countries. So please check that out at realagriculture.com. And I also interviewed yesterday uh, David Merritt, Minister of Saskatchewan, talking about this agri-recovery program. He is hoping that there will be an announcement by Friday on the agri-recovery program. Uh, I do have sources telling me, though, it more likely could be an announcement on Monday or sorry, Tuesday or Wednesday for Alberta and Saskatchewan. So stay tuned for that. If you have any feedback on today's show, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Thank you for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. And we'll chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for downloading this episode of the Real Ag Radio podcast brought to you by Economics. With one-of-a-kind tools, research, and content, Economics is farming's go-to information resource. Find it all on nutrient-economics.com or download the app.